We're here uh, to, um, to welcome uh, Tim Harper, who has his uh, work here on display. He's had it up here for the last uh, month, or the last two weeks. And um, uh, Tim uh, has a, a degree in uh, uh, graphic design from VCU. VCU, one of the very best uh, art schools in the country, not just in the state, has a national reputation that it has enjoyed for decades, really, as being one of the top um, art schools. So I, I highly recommend that. I've had several students uh, attend VCU uh, and uh, done very well there. And you, uh, in fact, my son went to VCU. So it's a really good school and for anybody who's thinking about pursuing art further, um, really should consider it. And I met Tim through the fact that we were in a uh, an exhibition in Richmond together in the same show, mm -hmm. and saw his work there. I think it was it was this piece yeah. specifically that was in that show. I thought it was really great. So I contacted him and asked if he wanted to uh, share his work with us here, and he graciously agreed. And uh, he uh, can tell you more specifically about his work. But as you um, as you hopefully have become aware, he has a please touch carefully or please touch gently policy about it because it's kinetic sculpture and invites um, your participation. And it's really uh, quite interesting stuff and it's made of things that he finds and puts together. So if you will please uh, join me in welcoming Tim. He'll tell us a little bit about his work and then we can ask him some questions. All right, thanks. Tim Well, thanks guys, thanks for having me. Uh, it was really great to come out here. I'll go yeah, anywhere I can drive and get my work somewhere. I'll go. So I've been doing this about eight years, I think, of making these. I started out collecting everything's found objects. All of these are kinetic. Not every single thing I make moves, but a lot of it does, and then all of these things do. Uh, the found objects, I started just, just in, out when I was out just walking around the neighborhood or, or wherever, clearing my head, just finding things. And I just collect them just as little pieces of inspiration to put on my desk, um, not with any idea that I was going, going to make anything out of them. And uh, that's just something I would do when I was out and about, always looking for interesting things wherever I was. And at some point, I got the idea of what, I, of what would it be like if I tried to build something out of those and started to get into the idea, well, maybe I should start, rather than just wherever I am, start actively looking for cool things when I'm out and about and see what I can do, what, what can I make with those? And uh, as the more I did it, the more I liked it, it was kind of like if you're painting and you have a limited palette or some a way to restrict yourself a lot of times, that's a way to kind of push you to do work. What I would get stuck is, is uh, I love to paint and draw, I love to do digital work, I'm also a graphic designer, I love to build things. Is, to, is when you get to the point, well, what am I going to build? What am I going to make? What am I going to draw? That was always a problem for me. Um, and so restricting myself and saying, well, what, what if I just build things out of only things I find? Well, what would happen? And, and it was a great way to kind of push past that and uh, did a couple little things and I really liked it. It started to really get into that idea of just trying to make things with all uh, found objects. So I went from collecting little things on my desk and, and building them on the dining room table when my family wasn't home to taking over the whole garage. That's a whole kind of, my wife says it's my library of found objects. I go collect things. Um, still when I'm out on walks, but they go to thrift stores and, and junkyards and anywhere I can find interesting things. And I don't really tr collect them with the idea of, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a specific thing. Like, I don't have the, the idea of what the project's going to be when I collect these things. I'm just looking for things that I find interesting, whether it's shapes or, or colors or textures or materials. So you can tell, obviously, I like old metal things. I like old cameras. I like anything that has screws in it I can take apart, just so I can take it apart and see what's inside, see how it works. But I don't really collect any of these things with the final project in mind. Uh, how my work's kind of evolved is into a, a little three-step process. One is just collecting things whenever I'm out and about. And the second part is design. It's just I got my little garage, you know, it's about this space, and when I go out there to design something, that's, that's it. Everything that I have is here, and that's all I'm going to build something out of. 
and it's kind of like building a collage. I'm not really looking at any of these things for, for what they were before. That was a heater, you know, there's cameras, there's clock parts, there's typewriter parts. I don't, I don't really, not really worried all that much about what the thing was before. I just like looking at it for what it, just its uh, texture and color and shape and all of those things. And so when I'm putting them together, I'm just collaging things together. What do I, do I like these colors together? Or I like this wood with this metal. Um, those kind of things, and it's just, and I don't usually have an end idea in mind of what it's going to be. And part of that is because when I try too hard to, to have this end idea in mind, well, it's kind of hard to get there when you don't know what you're going to make it with, and when you've got a gumball machine and a projector, and then you can't really plan what you're, what you're going to make in the end, and there's, there's, no, there's no instructions for that, um, which I like, because it means I'm never wrong, right? <laughs> But uh, so I just try to go step by step. What do I, I like these two things together. All right, what's next? What else would I, what else would work with that? And then the third part of that, so it's collect design and then build is just the problem solving of how to make these things work. Not everything I make moves, but everything here does. So you've got to think kind of about engineering and, and weight uh, and, and how things connect together. Uh, the things on the top that move, they can't be too heavy. They, they've got to be balanced a certain way. And, and so that's kind of that third step, but it's not necessarily a linear thing. It's all happening at once, and I go back and forth uh, between those sort of stages of building and designing and collecting, and I'm always out looking for new things. Uh, I've also found that the best way for me to do these is to be a little scatterbrained, and I don't just work on one, because if I work on one and I get stuck, Oh, man, I'm just all bummed out. What am I going to do? I don't know what to do next. It doesn't work. And, and there's a lot of these. I don't have any background in, in making things, per se, other than I just like making things. No professional background. So it's all trial and error. And for every one of these, I've got two or three at home that never worked. You know, they just go back in the pile, and I take them back apart. Um, but if I, if I have four or five going at once, and if I get stuck, I can just push aside and work on something else. Um, I've also found uh, over time that if, if, I, if I try to overthink things, I can try, try to figure out, I say I don't plan from the beginning, but you're always thinking about what am I going to do next, and it's easy to get stuck in your head, like, what do I do? What do I do now? It's not, and the best way for me to get out of that uh, is to just, uh, I had a teacher that used to tell me, just ready, fire, aim, and she was trying to tell me, just go get your hands involved in something and you'll figure it out even if you don't know what you're going to do. And that I found to be really helpful with these. Um, and so I keep little, I have always collecting little machines, even just little tape recorders and stuff from Goodwill. It doesn't have to be anything super fancy from an antique store. And when I get stuck, I just go out and I take things apart and see how they work and pull the pieces apart. And those don't always end up in a sculpture, but it kind of gets me thinking about how things move and, and uh, just lets the materials drive what I'm making rather than me trying to figure it all out in my head, the abstract, without doing it. Or when all else fails, I just get a piece of wood and drill holes in it with a drill press. I mean, just stuff like that, just to get your hands moving. <coughs> because I really think, as far as problem solving, you don't, your mind doesn't exactly work the same way. It works a little differently when you're doing things with your hands rather than just thinking about them. So it's a good way to kind of kick things loose. Um, so that's it. That's, that's, that's pretty much what I do. Um, you guys have any questions about any of these or anything? Yeah. Full of questions all the time. So what are you trying to say? What do you? What does the message that your art tells? I mean, I can interpret somewhat of a, with this piece right here, I can interpret that the eye of the camera and then this might be the, the subject of the camera. Sure. And I notice that you have incorporated in, in the, uh, this is all very uh, man-made and structured, and then you mm -hmm. incorporate a, a God piece in Sure. Is there is there some sort of um, meaning or rhyme or message to your art? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't I don't really try to 
to get too defined about what I'm making or, or, or define it too well, uh, to me the basic I thought behind it is just paying attention to things. A lot of these things are not they're not, uh, so a lot of the vegetation, this stuff, it's not from flower shops, it's weeds outside of my house. And now I thought, you know, just by being aware of my surroundings when I'm out and down, I thought these really interesting things. And, and I, I feel like once you kind of like, get in that mode of, of just trying to pay attention to the world around you, there's a lot of interesting things. And there's always more, I guess, to know about the world than about anything. Um, and that's the only real drive for me behind this. I also don't get real into specific messages with these sometimes because uh, people will come to me at shows and tell me things that it, what it means to them and it's way better than anything I thought of and, and I don't want to shut that down kind of beforehand I guess for example that I had I had a work at the R the RVA Makers Fest they have every year at the Science Museum and uh, I had sort of a half-built thing it was a sewing machine you know, the old-fashioned pedal sewing machine and um, it was a half-built sculpture for something else, but I thought it was kind of interesting. I'll bring it along, and I had a, a, and I attached uh, the sewing machine wasn't there, but I I made a what do you call it? wheel and axle on it, and put an umbrella on the end, and, and spun it around. And to and to it was all a parents and kids type event. And to all the parents, they were super interested in this old sewing machine because they had relatives maybe when they were younger that used, that, that used those and that sewed their own things and I'd hear the story over and over again they were telling their kids you know Grandma Helen used to fix her own clothes with that and the kids really weren't interested in that to them it made awesome sounds and it was really cool to pump it and it moved a thing on the end and that's what it meant to them and I kind of didn't really want to shut the idea I did not want to shut either of those down so I don't I don't get into real specific messages I'm just interested in sort of the materials of it um, and kind of exploring these these kind of forgotten things that are uh, maybe they don't they outlive their useful life or whatever they were designed for whether it's this old this old uh, heater or or the cameras and things like that but that they're still they're still interesting things that I think you can give another life to. Um, and so, so would you say repurposed? Yeah, into, yeah. Repurposed into art. Sure. Or yeah, and maybe kind of repurposed into art. Yeah, and, you, and then you could do that with with really anything, and there's something of value and of interest in, in, in anything, even things that have been thrown away. But the purpose is that it's art now. Sure, yeah, 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 just, uh, yeah, and hopefully something interesting for people to interact with. Well, I think that's interesting with the, inter the interaction part of it, too, because um, one of the things that I miss being the generation that I am, the, the transition from mechanical things to electronic things, and. The disappointment that I have in looking at electronic things is you can't look at them and by looking at them understand how they work. Sure. Because the electron they work on an electronic level and they do amazing things, but you can't look at the cause and effect of of your action, your interaction with the object pushing the you know, touching a touch screen. Right. It doesn't there there's no kind of um, physics that you can observe. Sure. And that's really great about the treadle you're talking about. Yeah, the, yeah, the right. Treadle action on that sewing machine, which I don't even know if a lot of people, young people, aren't even are familiar with that treadle action sewing machine. I mean, imagine a sewing machine that you know doesn't have electricity and just you make it run. Right. And um, but that how it's such a it's a simple thing, but it's how the the the, the this treadle action translates into a circular motion. It's yeah, rotation, yeah. Which is, um, and if you can, if you're a kid and you've never really seen that, if you've been surrounded with electronics your whole life, and you see that cause and effect of this, this action being translated into that action, it, you know, it's, it's something in itself is just a really cool thing to see. I, I think that that's, uh, and in a way, your work is kind of exposing, reintroducing people to it that maybe don't have it a lot in there. Yeah, I really like that too, and I think about I'm really interested in that. Right, the tangible cause and effect. You can see how this these uh, analog motors work. If you, this gear turns to that to that thing, and kind of see how it gets to the end. But you're right on that that treadle sewing machine because I used that later or in another in an exhibit called In Light Richmond. And kids loved how that worked, man. How you 
you pump it like a gas pedal and it you know moves this thing above it was really just i found that mechanics of that fascinating because you don't see that uh you just don't and these you don't need that for a day. Most of these are all spring driven. Right? <coughs> right. So you wind up the spring and it's the. Right. Un, un yeah, the yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the tension in the spring is slowly releasing that spiral spring is what makes it move. When I was young, we had a couple of uh, things. Uh, Mousetrap, it was called. It was a thing that yeah, you yeah. built and then it. it, it Eventually yeah, right? caught the mouse. Right. And then we had this one toy, um, and although it had a, a, no, I think it was a white erector set. It mm -hmm. was a, it was, it came in with like lots of pieces, and then you designed all these different things from it. Right. Yeah. Um, the way things work and stuff. Um, I uh, I like the camera because. Uh, I took photography and I was being really cheap. I didn't want to to uh, get the $800 camera, so I brought my old 35 uh, uh, yeah. millimeter in. And every time the teacher wanted to to show something, he'd just grab my camera <laughs> and go, "And this is where the f-stop is." And this, you know, he would he would. He would revert back to that camera that I had to show the class the mechanisms of the f-stop and the the timer and all that stuff. Right, right. For me, I I, I actually uh, produced some really nice photographs because I was at, I was able to to set the the f-stop and the time and stuff like that and. Uh, uh, Precisely how I wanted it on the manual camera. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And they do still and make that, mouse trap. Well, that's right. you know that's funny with it because automatic when they, when things are automatic they do things for you you lose connection to what's what's right. happening. So other people have questions. People have questions. Yeah, you know, I was building uh, a lot of things with, with hand cranks on them and trying to figure out how different mechanical processes worked and, uh, and starting to scavenge every you know, thing we had around to build with. And my wife had this old music box from when she was a kid and she said, uh, clean out the attic and this is broken. I mean, you can, do you want this? And I said, sure, I'll take it apart. And, and the first, that was the first one I made with that. Uh, with a music box on it, and I thought that I liked the idea with these. I was wanting to build things that moved and that people could touch, and then that added music. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, it adds the, the sound element to it too, and I thought, why don't I try doing some more of that? So it, that kind of spiraled from there, and I've probably done about 50 of those now in new music boxes, just because there's a cool way to add another element to it. Would you have to go seeking out music boxes specifically, I guess, that, that little machine? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I was, you know, first I was looking around at thrift shops and things and found some, uh, and other people that had them in their attic, and then I was going to eBay, where you can find them. So you, you can find them if you look, but it does take a little work. Right. But it's a great little, it's like a little engine that you can have that. Right. And, you, and then the added music, like you said, that was certainly music. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I love there, just, just by, uh, like most of the good ideas I had, it was actually my wife's like, yeah, right, good. good. Other people? <clears throat> Did, by chance, any of your work, I know you mentioned a lot of your work was individuals and, you know, build off the music box and things like that. Did any of your work kind of relate to something further along, like, did it give you any idea of how to build something else or something else you really need to do? Yeah, yeah, right, and, it, and, and so it's a lot of trial and error building, and I think, well, for, for any of these and, and some bigger things I've done, it's I've learned a lot just by doing it about how to attach things together, how things move together. Uh, without having done these smaller ones, I, I couldn't have done, a couple years ago, I did I did a, a moving sculpture with motor someone asked me to do that was probably six or seven feet high and four feet wide. And just having that experience of, of doing these smaller things, learning a lot about the mechanics, 
help me do that. I couldn't have gone from, I couldn't have done that without all this. And just as I as gone on, at, um, working with some other friends on collaborations, I've done some bigger things as well. That just this process has taught me a lot about building things that I've helped with. Like, like I got involved in a project at a school and uh, that we just finished and it was to build. They wanted, they, they wanted to, uh, it was with the Alliance with the Chesapeake Bay and they wanted to figure out a cool way to take the water coming off the roof and put it over a big garden area over these plants to filter the water because it's about a mile from the James River there and as it was, it was just firing this dirty water out into the gutter and into the river. So uh, I worked on, on that and there's, in the end there's nothing that moves and I had to get fabricators to build everything, but without learning all of this, I would have had no idea how to help design it. And so it ended up being a big, sort of like Roman aqueducts that drain water down over top of something, uh, of all these plants off of the roof. And the tallest one's about seven feet high, and go down to about four. Uh, and it's permanent, you know, it's the first outdoor sculpture I've done that's permanent. And so that was really cool to be able to be a part of that. But, I never would have any, had any idea how to help design it without just the experience of figuring, figuring out how to make these. Right. I think it's really interesting the idea of, of sort of thinking in, in action, thinking, mm -hmm. which is a really, um, uh, I think, really important thing for artists to, to um, incorporate it in their work. Is that um, if you, you know, if you just sort of sit and try to come up with something, it can be really, really a block. Yeah. Just start doing, just start, even though you don't know what you're doing, right. just start acting. And I remember, you know, people in analog, but to that would be like in writing, people will say as a writer, just just start writing right. without knowing what you're going to write about and start. Sure. The action of, of acting is important to the creative process. That's sort of yeah, and that, and that took me a long time to kind of internalize that and figure it out, but it helped me a lot because I spent countless frustrating hours going, what am I going to do? Thinking that you could just plan it all in your head and then do it. But it helps a lot. Yeah, there was a, I think it was Ernest Hemingway would deliberately stop at the end of the day in the middle of a sentence. And he said, now, now I know where to start in the morning. <laughs> That's it was fun. him or another fairly <laughs> young writer. <laughs> so, and so that even something like that, like just drilling. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, and the, the, if you drill a few holes, then you, you'd be surprised how it gets you thinking. Right, right, yeah. And it's just fun to drill a few. use tools. Yeah. And then what do you think, you know, uh, Richard brought up like some things about where does meaning come from? And like, I think, I think, I think it's surprising how much meaning comes out of uh, the process. Like mm -hmm. you, you're doing something, and you know, I guess some artists they think they've got a grand idea, and they say, "Now I'm going to make a work of art that expresses this idea that I have." Right. And then other people are, especially from what you described, mm -hmm. they're doing a work, and it can be very surprising how much meaning comes out of it. And sometimes people. I think have the wrong impression that what that means is that uh, is is that all the meaning is uh, arbitrary, but I don't think that's true. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I think you're right. It's a lot of the meaning is just got, I, I care a lot. I'm interested a lot in the craft of making things, and uh, the meaning I think for me is in that, and it's it's kind of taking things that we're not useful anymore and by caring a lot about them and, and putting a lot of work into making them something uh, meaningful again they can be interesting and hopefully that comes out in it but you're right i think that's where sort of the meaning for me comes from that right. process of, yeah. of caring I mean, about the craft a lot yeah and like just like that heater box that mm -hmm. just you know doesn't i mean it's not so much that the heater box has even anything to do with being a heater. Sure, yeah. It has to do partly with just a whole uh, uh, nostalgic aesthetic or something, or, 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 or you know, the, you know, there's actually little birds that go round and round inside that, and so there's like life inside this whole thing. And that's, right. I mean, that, that, that meaning can be really resonant about life, inner life inside, um, you know, this bad little thing. Yeah. So that's, that's and, and I guess what I, somehow trying to say is, is, you know, sometimes people think 
that when meeting enters a work that way, it's less legitimate or that it's not intended, so mm -hmm. it's not preconceived. But I think that the stuff really comes out in a, um, I think it's very uh, real, you know. Uh, it just gets in there through an intuitive common, your, your intuitive combining of things imbues it with meaning. It doesn't, and the fact that you didn't first write it down is what your intention was. Sure. It's just a different way for it to enter. Yeah, yeah, I th yeah. And for me, and the meaning for for me building these, every every single piece matters a lot, and I care about it, and I hope that comes out in the end. But if it, it it does to me, and yeah, and in this, and then when I found that heater, it was in this old salvage yard, which sadly is closed now. But it was it was like my favorite, my favorite place to go. <coughs> um, I found it in a pile of things. It was so interesting, and I'm a graphic designer as well, so I'm a typography nerd, and I love this. I love the type on here and the graphics of it. It's very of an era. I don't know when, but I felt like it went a lot with. I liked it and thought it matched well with that table leg, um, maybe from the same era and the same kind of lines to it, and, and maybe the way and, and this root in here is an avocado root. It was one of the hundred times I've tried to grow an avocado from a seed and get a big root and it never actually grows into a full plant. But I really like the root. It was cool. And, 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 and how that relates to the back there is a tin ceiling from, we used to put tin ceiling panels in the roofs and I always thought those were interesting. Now they do these elaborate patterns on there. So I've, I've salvaged a bunch of those over time when I can find them. And just so all of those little interactions are, are meaningful. Um, this is something I've thought about, you know, I think about a lot of different things, but I've thought about it, and um, um, my, my, my intent, um, like uh, broken, broken pottery or, or things from the past, my intent is to immortalize them, you know. Yeah, I like put a, a bunch of related things in a shadow box and, and make it art and then it is immortalized uh, because it's, 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 it's something that's going to be passe and, and not sure, yeah. But if I, if I make it into art, then I can immortalize it and people can say, oh, what's that, a temple? Or, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, our, our, even with shells that that uh, are, are fully intact and stuff like the Nautilus Nautilus shell, yeah. I, I I like to mount them on wood and then make them uh, something uh, on a wall and then instead of nature crumbling and crashing and 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 what it normally does, right? I, I, same with society, what society does does with stuff it just it uses it up and then it's gone and and there's some things like that camera that uh, I see that in your work is that you're 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 immortalizing you're this is going to live on right whereas yeah. it's time it's time has gone past but you've extended the life of this camera and the life of that projector uh, which you know, right now, uh, with the technology, we 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 don't even have tape decks or CD players or records or in, in fact, everything is going to be up in the cloud. <laughs> sure. <laughs> the, yeah. The the tangible things that that uh, that we used to have just they're not going to be here anymore. Yeah, I like that that idea of talking about immortalizing things and and, and uh, that's a good way of putting it. And there's a lot there's a lot of great things that come out of, out of you know, digital things and dealing with things from the cloud and, and all that. But there's also something to be said for immortalizing these older things. So yeah, if I can ex extend their life uh, a little bit, it's it's kind of a fun thing to think about. Yeah. I was wondering about it seems like a lot of your art has really good aesthetic and composition, but you talk as if you just kind of put it together and play with it until voila, something happens. But if I were to do that, it would not have composition or aesthetic. So how do you let that 
art process also guide the mechanical process and come to a marriage that is something pretty cool? Yeah, that's a good good question. And I, I, I uh, when I'm doing that, it, it's not it's not haphazard. You know, each of those little decisions, it's an aesthetic decision about these two pieces. How do they they work together? And and you're right. The challenge is is keeping in the back of my head. How does that work mechanically for these in the end? And the only way I've been able to figure that out is just just through trial and error and, and trying to be patient with it. And, and I just got to try to be, I'm just trying every day when I work on one of these, it can be frustrating sometimes when you get stuck, but I'm just trying to do it. If I can learn one more thing than I knew yesterday, then that's all right, that's good. You know, and tomorrow I'll do the same thing, do the same thing and you stack those up. I mean, year from now, hopefully, what I'm making then is, is much better than what I made a year ago. Um, but a lot, of, yeah, taking those little one step at a time, trying to make every connection of those things matter uh, aesthetically uh, is a good challenge, but I, I love that part of it. And even my background in graphic design helps too because you're doing the same, that same problem solving is there. Um, I, I went to school for graphic design. I did that uh, for a marketing company for about five years and then I freelanced on my own since about 2007, and I still do that some, but and that's when I started building these, because one day I realized like, hey, I'm the boss, I can do what I want, you know, I want to go out and start building things, you know, when I have free time and get, get out from in front of the computer and stop going blind all the time looking at my screen. Um, when I started building these, but I found a lot of that, it's a similar sort of problem solving process if you can get down to just, I've got these elements to play with, how, how can they work? And that, that was part of what helped in just limiting what I was going to use because the possibilities are not endless if you only have 12 things. I'm just, I'm, I've got 12 things here and I'm going to make something out of at least seven of them and that's it. And, it, and, and it's not you no know, getting caught up and I'm going to make, this is going to be the best thing ever. Or, you know, those kind of things probably anybody that's made art can get stuck on. I'm just going to make the best thing I can make today with these things, and that's it. And that's and that that can be good enough. And just learning every day to try to do that a little better. Yeah, that's that's um, a lot of uh, uh, design. Uh, I've had designer friends who talk about that idea of problem solving, and that's a really interesting thing that I think a lot that maybe maybe people don't realize is such a big part of art is is problem solving. It's right. Like you're gonna, and and in um, in graphic design, uh, it is you are working with limitations because you have you have specific ideas that have to get across. Or sure. You have certain oh I don't know maybe a typeface you have to work within or you right. but still make something new out of it. And, so I see how that works with limiting, because you're right that if you then just say, okay, here's a, a, a blank canvas and you know a, a box full of paint, like right. you can do anything, anything. I, I often have students that <laughs> I have paid students sometimes who say, well, I just I want to make something abstract, and I say, well, go ahead, and they don't know how hard it is. Sure. And one yeah. of the hardest things is, well, what's the first thing you do? And that's very, very difficult. And it's easier to start with a problem sometimes. Mm -hmm. So your idea of limited materials, of limiting your material choices, then uh, sparks helps to spark that. Yeah, you're right. And that's when I was doing uh, when doing the graphic design. It's you, you've got a problem to solve, but someone else has told you what the problem is, and they and and then you usually got a limited. Space that you got this content and you have to use certain typefaces. Maybe you decide that, maybe you don't, and you've got images to use, but you kind of need that to figure out what to do. You need those limits, and, and starting with these, that, that was the problem. Is that now I've got to figure out what the problem I'm solving is, and I've got to figure out what to use. So, <clears throat> in that sense, it added another step, and that's where working with the found things came from. And with these, it was I'm going to build out of only these things, and I've got to make something that moves, and those are the rules. Yeah. But uh, it's hard when you got to make rules. Right. A lot of you're making the, the rules that you chose for yourself, that was the first choice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's your first choice. Right, right. right. So, yeah. And, then, and Morgan, I want, I want to put you on the spot because you, you profiled me. Um, oh, I was just 
trying to remember. <coughs> um, the, the research topic you did. Willie was, Cole. Willie Cole, right? Willie Cole. And he is an artist that uses. Are you familiar? He uses um, found materials, especially. And did you? Um, was there anything particular about that you remember him saying about that? About the ch choices he makes in choosing objects to use? Because you did good research on that. Um, he just uses stuff that people would throw away or not use anymore, repurpose it in art and stuff. Probably yeah, like yeah. Finding a new life for it, basically. And a lot of times he'll use this, like, he, he'll he use multiples of the same things. Like, yes. like if he signs a woman's high heel shoe, and he'll like find all, like, like 100, 200 shoes, they'll all be, they'll all have that in common. I mean, just, so it's a little yeah, different. Yeah, it's right, different right. Doing. In, in that, I mean, it's using found out, but there's, it's good to think about the fact that there's different ways to do that. Right. You know? So he's, he's going to say, I'm going to make, his problem is, I'm going to make an object using only this one type of object. Yeah. Or shoes or bottles or, and so the whole thing is made of one repeated model. Yeah, but it's totally, it's a totally different, different yeah. thing. And right. Yeah. I, I, uh, recently met a student who was a friend of a friend and she was really interested in, in, in uh, what she did, she collecting old computers and taking them apart and she loves to build edible circuit boards, building circuit boards, and I have all only circuit boards. And there's an artist whose name escapes me, but this, this is the, you know, when I look for a lie I want to do someday, he makes these gigantic sculptures and he had this giant wave and it's made out of canoes. It's like old aluminum canoes, he's welded together and another one out of I, he found a bunch of junk school buses and made it up uh, all the doors. He just took all the doors off of like 50 school buses and built that. There's a guy um, who's from Virginia. I don't remember where, uh, but he he uh, started a project. And he's done it in nine or ten cities now, where he goes to a city and asks to borrow ladders. And it was something from when he was young. It was kind of a community thing. When, you know, not everybody had a ladder. You just borrow a ladder. And they bring ladders, and they put their name on it. And he builds sculptures out of people's ladders. And they're super cool. These, I mean, they'll just take over like, you know, the town square, green space, and build these giant sculptures out of ladders. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, I can't. His name is sick me now, too. Uh, I know him. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, and, and it's a great. It's a community project because he goes around to all yeah. the community and he. he he purposely, he, when he arrives in this town, he doesn't have any ladders. Right. He doesn't bring ladders with him. He goes around and borrows ladders from everybody. Yeah, everybody puts things like he tags them all real nice with a little thing, like a luggage tag that has their name and phone number so he can get them back afterward. Right, right. That's right. part of the whole and project. He, he makes soaring power yeah. out of these things. Which, yeah, it's a idea. Um, yeah, that's right. That's Another idea I have uh, is uh, a found thing is. Uh, find things that are representative of the culture that's going on at that time that can, can place a time stamp. Like, uh, uh, this is like a lot, I noticed, you know, a lot of those uh, uh, trash that, what are those things, blunts, wrappers? You, oh, you know, yeah, you, you yeah, used yeah. to see those and now you see those. That's representative of what people are doing, you know, sure, or, yeah, you yeah. know, uh, stuff that you find, uh, probably trash and stuff that that uh, that I could put together that would represent uh, a a fad or a, or something that's, you know, something that tells something about the the, the civilization, the society at that time. Sure, I right, certainly. Uh, yeah. That's another idea I have about found stuff. That yeah, and there's usually endless... stuff because people litter all the time. Sure. You know, yeah. And 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 every time I walk out of Walmart, I see stuff on the on the ground, but it's all representative <coughs> of, of a time stamp. Right. You right. Know what I'm that's another idea. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, this part. <laughs> I need stuff. Put these right, things right. Into action. Right. Right. Into action. I was wondering in building these music box things, did the the, the song that the music box plays affect at all how the decoration is on it? That's a good question. A lot of times it, it didn't because I just was getting whatever I could get music box wise. Mm -hmm. There's at least one, and I can't 
remember if it's one of these. I think it's one at home that I have that, that has been broken through too much love. But I did it where I searched and searched to find uh, uh, this song. Uh, it's called Laura's Theme. Ba basically, it was my mom's favorite song. And it was after she passed away. And I was mm -hmm. like, I want to do something with that. Um, and that, I think, is the only, only one where it was really, and, there, and there's one other one that was, um, but I, I think that's the only time it's really affected what I, what I build on the top. Maybe I should say yes. That would be, yeah. that would be smarter if I did it that way, or it sounds a lot smarter. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just, you, you, I've played you most of these. Like yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Uh, and walking through, I've played most of these, and I just wondered if they were, there was anything. Yeah. That's, no. that's fine. If it's fine, if it doesn't. Yeah. I just wonder. And then you then you use. It must be pretty interesting because I've seen some of them you're using like prop keys to uh -huh. augment. Like some, a couple of them have the original, those little, those little music box keys. Yeah. And some of them then you add on a, uh, a clock key or a different kind of knob. But then some of your devices actually have knob. Right, like the gumball machine. Yeah. I didn't know when I built that if people were just going to be mad that no gum came out of it. Mm -hmm. But most people like it. Like, where's the candy? Well, it's so perfect, perfect with this little vitrine and like the mm -hmm. sculptures protected inside the globe. And the, mm -hmm. Yeah, I love I love collecting little knobs and keys and things as well. That one's from an old the old TV. It's like the UHF yeah. knob um, thing. Have you ever thought of working with the player piano? That would be cool. Yeah, uh, I saw one one time in the junkyard, but I just wasn't brave enough to try to buy it. It seemed like too big. I'm like, I don't know. It's That's pretty big. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to get that out of here, but I kind of wanted it and wish I did. <laughs> you know, um, do you know the artist Joe Kelly? Do you know Joe Kelly? He's a Blacksburg-based artist. He picked up a, uh, not a player piano, but an old broken piano. I think that provided him with the mechanics yeah. for sculptures for probably five years. Yeah, there's yeah. So, there's so much stuff inside. Right. You know, which it doesn't work. No, but yeah, just pulling that thing apart. Because yeah. um, I was wondering, the reason I was asking about the knobs is that you, you have to, I mean, it's one thing to put a new knob on something, but when you have a piece like this, or what was the other piece that was like that, where the the knob mechanism exists, and then having to fit the the uh, uh, music box me mechanism to it. Yeah, uh, an extra problem. That was an extra problem to solve, but I really felt like on the gumball. I have two gumball machines. This one and another one. Like I couldn't, I couldn't. Do, yeah, I had to, I had to, I had to make that work somehow, and and it did in the end. I was glad, but. Um, yeah, it's just a, just a fun challenge to try to figure out. Sometimes maddening, but fun when it works. Yeah. Well, does anybody else have questions? Four? Yeah, four. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, I guess then what I'd like to invite you to do is to go ahead and, and uh, have a little more snack, but it, it, informally maybe you'll have, a, you know, Something that you'd like to ask him himself. Yeah, I'll be here for a while. Very coachable, nice guy. And please feel free to ask him any questions. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks, y'all. Thank you, thank you, thank you guys so much for coming.